So uh, it's always so incredible for me to, to hear Michael Moe speak. I, I just met him for the first time a year ago. Uh, I think he shared last night that he's moved to Dallas a couple of years ago. And when he came to SMU and talked about his vision for this mission summit, uh, and really that SMU was the institution that he would want to partner with uh, in, this, in this endeavor, I just had so much excitement and anticipation. I think uh, those of you who uh, are part of our SMU community and, and being here now, even if you're, you're not an SMU alum or student or faculty, you are now part of our community, but you know that our motto is world changer shaped here. And uh, we, take that, uh, we take that really seriously. And, and I think this, this summit's aims are at the heart of what we strive to do both uh, through and for our campus community. So uh, as an institution of higher education, it really is uh, part of our ethos that we are shaping uh, and have a responsibility for shaping our students who in turn will be the workforce but also the leaders of tomorrow. And I think we're therefore uniquely positioned both in the uh, content that we teach uh, and the communities that we serve for impact. With the goals of this summit in mind, uh, the focus on my talk is gonna be on the future of higher education. And I think having a better understanding of the current and projected trends in our industry will give us the frame of reference needed to bring about lasting and what we believe will be very impactful change. Before I begin, let me acknowledge that uh, many prognosticators have a negative outlook on the future of higher education. As with many industries, the pandemic was a great disruptor. Skeptics have often cited school closings, mergers, rising costs, and austerity measures as proof that the future of higher education is bleak. Like many of you, I, I share a quite different perspective. I think changes are afoot, no doubt, in higher education. Uh, many of these changes were occurring pre-pandemic, but, uh, and, and I think in some cases have only accelerated since then. But the higher education model, which has been refined over, gosh, more than a millennia, I think has shown itself to prove uh, very resilient and effective in preparing our future generations for the world around them and around us. And this has been historically true even in times of major demographic shifts. And that includes technology, the financial upheaval we've heard about and will remain true in the future. So I wanted to, in today's talk, really distill uh, higher education's future down to three points that I wanted to discuss with you today. Accessible, digital, and customizable. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna walk you through each of these three points in greater detail and what they will mean to our future in higher education. Accessibility has been a top goal across higher education for decades. In the past few years, however, we have experienced even greater interest and expectations. Education, as we know, is the great equalizer, and as the gateway to professional opportunity, it plays a vital and fundamental role in elevating people from a broad range of backgrounds and experiences. Demographics play a very important role in this path to access, and I wanted to share some interesting data that speaks to the changes that we can anticipate in the demand for higher education in our country and the impacts these are likely to have on our sector. Many of you have likely heard about the great enrollment cliff, and that was, uh, that's the steep drop in college age population that's projected to begin going into effect in about 2025. And that's an, uh, associated with the declines in the U.S. birth rate associated with the Great Recession of 2008, mean that there would be fewer college-age students, the 17 to, or 18 to 21, pursuing college starting in 2025. While that decline is real, uh, as you will see in the figures I'm about to show you, it fortunately is not looking to be as severe as originally forecast and does not impact our nation's regions or all race and ethnicities equally. 
So by reviewing this data, I think we can understand some of the strategies needed to prepare for the coming reality. So this is a graph from the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. I'm going to refer to it by its acronym for the rest of my talk, or WICHE, W-I-C-H-E. And really, this is the gold standard for demographic projections in higher education. The number of high school graduates in the United States has been increasing for two decades. This increase will continue uh, through 2026, and then it's going to decline into the 2030s. And again, this decline is mostly attributable to a decline in birth rates during the Great Recession from about 2009 to 12, and so those newborns will reach college age from about 2026 to 2029. The origin of the term demographic cliff comes from Wichi's analysis. So you can see why when looking at that steep drop from around 2025 to 2026 depicted on the graph. And I wanted to note that this analysis was released several years ago in Wichi's ninth edition. Last year, Wichi released an updated 10th edition that included a higher peak in 2026 and a slower rate of decline after that. So the good news here is that Wichi isn't really calling this a dem demographic cliff anymore. The trend line is smaller, of course, the, and the decline is not as pronounced, but it's still a, a hill. It's a downward hill. And colleges and universities must still prepare for these challenges, but as you'll see in subsequent slides, Texas is a very good place to be as, as we do prepare for this. During the increases as well as the declines, more important or at least just as important as the number of students is who the students are. That's both their backgrounds and where they are from. The growth and decline in college age students will vary by region of the country. The strongest growth is happening in the South and West. The Midwest and Northeast region are seeing the greatest decline, both of those regions. And more specifically, Texas and Florida, and you heard from President Turner this morning, these are SMU's number one and number three states for incoming first year undergraduate students, are the most populous states to increase, both as a result of birth rates as well as net migration. Wichi also reports its projections based on the ethnic and racial makeup of the students projected to enter college for the next 20 years. In 2019, the majority of high school graduates, 51%, was white. As you can see on the blue bars on this chart, that percentage will continue to decline through 2036 when 43% of high school graduates will be white. We can anticipate increases in Hispanic graduates from 25% in 2019 to 28% by 2026, Asian from 6% in 2019 to 8% by 2036, and multiracial graduates from 3% in 2019 to 6% in 2036. And the number of black graduates is projected to remain about steady at, at 14% throughout that time span. So for many reasons, including the demographic ones presented here, universities must revise their strategies toward greater inclusion to ensure that the most talented students from all racial, socioeconomic, and family educational backgrounds will want to attend their schools. These graphs look at projections or growth rate of students by state as well as by race and ethnicity. So in the top left, with small pockets of exception in the southwest and west region, you can see declines in white students. The circles within each state highlight the trends for that population group in the major urban areas. We see growth, that's the shades of blue, in the numbers of Hispanic and Asian students going to college. Part of this growth is attributable to birth rate and part of it is the successful efforts taken to improve high school graduation rates among Hispanic students, particularly in states like Texas, California, and Florida. Growth in the number of black students is projected in regions of the Midwest, West, and Southwest with declines in the East and in the South. So colleges and schools experiencing population growth and diversification within their region who make the necessary adjustments in terms of strategy can benefit from these changes, while those schools 
in regions experiencing decline will face even greater challenges. Research by Nathan Graw, who is a leader in this space, tells us that the impact of these demographic changes will look differently based on the level of the prestige of the, of the institution. Elite schools, so those that are ranked in the US News and World Report top 50, uh, draw from a national applicant base and are expected to experience fewer challenges than, region, than, uh, uh, than elite schools are the top 50, the national schools are the 51 to 100. Both of those will, will uh, respond better and still draw from that national base. Regional schools, those that are uh, 100 plus in the rankings, uh, are predicted to, uh, to not perform as well. Now, of course, this conversation can extensively change. As we know, there's a lot of conversations happening right now about US News and World Report and trust in the rankings and how those might change. But at this time, uh, the data show there's significant differences based on where universities stand in those rankings. One of the ways to increase higher education's accessibility is by embracing our increasingly digital future. There are many paths I could take when considering higher education's digital future in the interest of time this morning. I'm gonna focus just on two. And one is the role of education in responding to and preparing our students, particularly undergraduates, for this world of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and virtual reality. How are we really responding to AI, AR, and VR, and the pace that, it is, that it's being uh, created and presented? And second, the role of technology in promoting access and learning outcomes for all students. So for example, of course, online learning opportunities. And here at SMU, we really focus on that, particularly at the graduate and uh, professional postgraduate levels. Students trained in AI will remain in high demand, and we can anticipate significant curriculum growth in this area as a result. When we think about a curriculum that can prepare students for the advancing digital age, uh, it begins for me with the practical. Our students must learn a new suite of technical skills that prepare them to program and interact with artificial intelligence. And further, and playing on the strengths of a traditional liberal arts education, we need to develop courses and plans and fields of study that address the philosophy and ethics of a world with AI and the pace at which it is, it is changing. Lastly, we must anticipate and increase demand for education and training in areas such as entrepreneurship and critical reasoning where AI is more likely to play a supporting rather than leading role and expand that curriculum in response. We're of course only beginning to understand and explore the ways as a society in which AI can support uh, not just uh, the human experience, but really at the university level, that it can support our student experience across the full academic life cycle, both in and beyond the classroom. Uh, but the next slide prepared by Microsoft Research gives a fairly comprehensive view of what we currently know to be possible and what is already beginning to occur as colleges and universities begin to develop a comprehensive campus strategy for AI. While AI is uh, highly unlikely, and faculty in the room, we really we do not see AI replacing our incredible faculty on college campuses, it's certainly going to play a pervasive role in all aspects of the campus experience, and it will change the way our faculty and staff engage students. In terms of student recruiting and retention, AI is already beginning to serve as a predictive modeling tool to ascertain institutional fit, to identify our students at risk of leaving, and to develop success strategies for timely graduation. AI is also transforming our classroom experience. We're all familiar, of course, with ChatGPT and the disruptions it is causing to the standard examination by essay or writing assignment, but we are responding to these new tools in positive ways through immersive and collaborative learning environments uh, and a chance to really learn and refine future-ready skills. AI is also transforming university operations. It's giving us tools previously unthinkable to manage data, security, and even our facilities. And finally, AI is transforming faculty research and innovation. 
and that's across the arts, uh, the sciences, and the professional schools. SMU's recent investments in high-performance computing, uh, especially through our partnership and collaboration with NVIDIA and the new DGX SuperPod, uh, position us well in this sector, and it's an incredibly powerful recruiting tool for enterprising faculty who are looking to participate in digitally supported research. And this is a, a picture of faculty from our uh, SMU Simmons School of Education working with faculty from SMU's Guild Hall, and that's our graduate school for game design and home to a lot of uh, many of our faculty experts in augmented reality and virtual reality. They're leveraging uh, augmented and uh, VR reality to train our future educators. So students who are themselves learning to be teachers have the opportunity to engage digital avatars in a series of scenarios. And this is aimed to promote engagement, learning, and even uh, to look at how to handle classroom disruptions. In addition to developing their teaching skills, our students then gain real life exposure and interaction with the tools and technology that they'll need in the future. The other way I'll highlight in which higher ed is preparing for a digital future is in the continued expansion of online learning. This is a space, obviously, in which higher education has been expanding. Uh, actually, it's been expanding gradually for the past two decades, but the digital learning environment uh, uh, underwent a much more accelerated transition both during and post-pandemic. Key learnings have led us to focus on online uh, and or hybrid learning as an effective approach, and that is particularly for the delivery of graduate and postgraduate degrees, as well as certificates and lifelong learning opportunities. Uh, and for our undergraduates, exposure to online learning, that's just particularly through these collaborative workspaces and engagement, are preparing them for the future of work. When we think about online learning and its potential, it is important to know the audience. The data on this slide, as well as the next one, is from a 2023 report by Education Dynamics. Uh, and Michael had actually mentioned this. We can see that more than 60% of students enrolled in online degrees as female, and about 70% of, of those respondents identify as white, and nearly 25% of respondents identify as black. So online learning, in addition to preparing for a digital future, can help reach uh, its goals and our goals for accessibility. As I mentioned, SMU's online strategy is, fo is focused most heavily on graduate and professional education. Uh, for reasons that I've, I've mentioned briefly, but also for a multitude of others, we really believe that the traditional undergraduate experience where students engage and learn in person and engage and, and uh, with each other and have the, the full social environment uh, is well suited for, for, the, for our undergrads. But of course, then exposing them to technology and tools and curriculum for a world surrounded by AI. Uh, but again, the figures in this chart show that online learning is an appealing option for those pursuing additional training and credentials. Nearly 60% of online learners report having full-time employment, and of those, nearly half reporting already having five or more years of work experience. With this in mind, it brings me to my last point, and that is the necessity for higher education in our future to be customizable. Uh, and that's really to our customers, not just to our students, but as well as to our corporate partners who help inform and shape demand. For higher education's future, which is accessible uh, and embracing the digital renaissance, we are undergoing uh, this customizable focus will be a key enabler. Given the disruptions of the digital world, uh, again, one in which we are living and working with AI, higher education must embrace this need and be nimble, flexible. And, and uh, I joke with President Turner all the time, this sort of this, the joy of being at a private and the pace and what we can do and being in DFW, it's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal of just how fast and nimble we can be and customizable. So we've, we face a future where a student's major and career plans might no longer be relevant in the years to come. 
Post-graduation, our students need upskilling more regularly and higher education should be flexible and nimble in its response to these demands. So we can address these through certificates and other forms of continuing education. And by partnering with industry, we can respond to the needs not just of our current, but also of our future workforce. In the years ahead, despite the considerable changes and pressures I've already uh, described today, Higher education in some ways will maintain its traditional approaches and much of its standard look and feel. Our ability at SMU to provide in-person residential engagement, and that's focused on a student's total experience, is a highly competitive advantage. However, with infusion of new knowledge comes the need for new foci. So providing the traditional college experience to an increasingly diverse student body will require new and additional resources and support structures. Technology has been and will continue to be a key enabler. And preparing an increasingly diverse student population for life in the digital marketplace and growing, of course, simultaneously their ethical, their critical, and complex reasoning skills will remain as they have been for centuries best delivered in a residential setting where learning, again, can take place both within and beyond the classroom. So I love this next picture. This is a uh, SMU music student bringing his art to inner city Dallas. Future students are likely to continue embracing the call for purpose and meaning behind their educational investment. As with the Mission Summit, our focus on for-profit ambition with the heart of a nonprofit, students are eager for opportunities to apply their learning in ways that really make an impact. Uh, they don't just say they want to make a difference, they, they really long for it. They want to do research, they want to build companies. Uh, we must be ready to match their enthusiasm and expectations by customizing their experiences along the way in line with their goals for what they want to achieve. And simultaneously, students must learn to engage with the technologies emerging around them. In this picture, you see an SMU undergraduate programming a drone to conduct aerial surveillance. Uh, you know, these technologies didn't exist a little over a decade ago. Absent the ability to adapt and to do so nimbly and with speed, the student would be learning how to interact with a drone in his garage. So, uh, and probably through trial and error as opposed to uh, with the guidance of, of faculty who are extremely advanced uh, and engaged in this. Again, remaining relevant for our future in this really rapidly changing world requires our ability to customize learning in response to the changes in our society. And again, I, it's not, I, I keep going back, it's not just technological, but also the social impacts that it has. Uh, while retaining the hallmarks that have made higher education truly the envy of the world. Although the path might not be as straightforward or clear cut as it was in the past, uh, our students need higher education to serve as a guide, as a way to see and navigate clearly through this dynamically changing world. And the challenges that we face as a society will only grow in complexity, but higher education has proven a resilient and effective training ground century after century. So I think uh, when we embrace, again, being ever more accessible, digital, and customizable, uh, the future is, is, very, is very bright. I want to conclude with a short video that uh, underscores some of our students and, and SMU's approach to uh, helping change the world around us. I am building a business. I'm shaping my world. I'm changing lives. At SMU, I found professors who care about my success. And the space to take risks. Make mistakes and grow quickly. I knew the problem could be solved. We just had to figure out how. I'm achieving things that I never dreamed I could. We're doing something that hasn't been done before. These experiences are helping me chart my own course. Dallas's can-do culture and SMU support bring out the best in me. We are turning our ideas into something real. We are creators, innovators, disruptors, builders, and problem solvers shaping the future. If we think it, it gets done. That's the enterprising spirit of SMU. 
Come reimagine the world with us. Thank you. So there's a break, and then we can uh, you can convene to the panels. Thank you all. <laughs>